Buongiorno, sono Leonardo e faccio parte di WeScience, il gruppo giovani di Bergamo Scienza. Le conferenze della ventiduesima edizione di Bergamo Scienza sono rese accessibili a persone con disabilità motorie e sensoriali, cercando di garantire luoghi privi di barriere architettoniche e grazie a servizi di traduzione LIS. Tutte le conferenze sono video registrate, alcune delle quali trasmesse anche in diretta streaming. Le conferenze con ospiti stranieri prevedono la traduzione simultanea. Le registrazioni verranno pubblicate sui nostri canali ufficiali al termine del Festival. Questi servizi sono resi disponibili grazie a Fondazione della Comunità Bergamasca e Fondazione Banca Popolare di Bergamo, che, insieme a Bergamo Scienza, sono impegnate a promuovere inclusione e accessibilità. Per la traduzione simultanea è sufficiente scannerizzare il QR code che vi possono fornire i volontari in sala o che trovate proiettato alle mie spalle. Il QR code vi indirizzerà direttamente a Converso Web App, dove potrete selezionare la lingua di interpretariato dal menu a tendina. Per l'ascolto della traduzione sono necessari gli auricolari. Vi chiediamo la cortesia di utilizzare i vostri. Chi ne fosse sprovvisto può chiedere ai volontari in sala. Vi do il benvenuto all'evento di questa mattina, intitolato Corpi nel Cosmo. Avremo il piacere di ospitare come relatrice Angelique von Ombergen, di ESA, Agenzia Spaziale Europea. La conferenza sarà moderata da Ilaria Zilioli, di Associazione Bergamo Scienza. Vi preghiamo di silenziare i vostri apparecchi elettronici e di partecipare numerosi alle iniziative di Bergamo Scienza. Grazie per l'attenzione e buon ascolto. Buongiorno a tutti, ben ritrovati ad un altro evento di Bergamo Scienza in collaborazione con l'Agenzia Spaziale Europea. Permettetemi, come sempre, innanzitutto di ringraziare gli organizzatori del Festival, tutti i sostenitori, gli sponsor e soprattutto i numerosissimi e giovani volontari di Bergamo Scienza, perché grazie a loro ogni anno la nostra città ha il privilegio eh, non, eh, non indifferente di eh, poter vivere due settimane di scienza, di conoscenza, di cultura, grazie appunto all'organizzazione alla di tutte queste persone che eh, gratuitamente si mettono a disposizione per, eh, per la nostra città. Quindi penso che sia una cosa veramente molto importante. E detto ciò, eh, sono molto onorata di eh, presentare la relatrice di oggi, Angelique van Ombergen, che è una mia collega all'Agenzia Spaziale Europea, che eh, si è specializzata con un dottorato di ricerca nello studio del, del cervello presso l'Università di Anversa, e in particolare di come il cervello reagisce nelle missioni spaziali, sia dal punto di vista fisiologico, perché quando andiamo nello spazio siamo in un ambiente di microgravità, quindi lontani dall'atmosfera terrestre, e sia dal punto di vista psicologico, perché andare nello spazio in un ambiente eh, estremamente ostile all'essere umano e vivere in un ambiente che è quello delle stazioni spaziali o delle capsule spaziali molto ristrette e a stretto contatto con altre persone, ha anche ovviamente degli impatti sulla nostra eh, psiche. Quindi questo è l'argomento di cui lei ci parlerà oggi. Angelique, dopo la specializzazione, quindi presso l'Università di Anversa, dove anche è eh, visiting professor, quindi continua la collaborazione e la ricerca universitaria, è entrata a far parte dell'ESA nel 2019, dove attualmente ricopre la funzione di Chief Exploration Scientist per le missioni ehm, che noi chiamiamo umane, di, di esplorazione umana e robotica, quindi tutte quelle missioni dell'ESA che sono rivolte a portare gli astronauti e in futuro anche forse eh, gli altri esseri umani eh, nel, nello spazio. Per adesso ovviamente Angelique lavora a stretto contatto con gli astronauti dell'ESA e quindi infatti la sua sede eh, di lavoro è a Colonia, dove eh, si trova il centro di addestramento degli astronauti. Ma Angelica è soprattutto un'appassionata divulgatrice di scienza, 
eh, sia perché partecipa a numerose conferenze internazionali, sia perché scrive e in particolare si rivolge alle giovani generazioni scrivendo dei libri per bambini tradotti in numerose lingue e tra l'altro ce n'è anche uno che vi segnalerà lei più tardi tradotto in italiano qualora i ragazzi qui presenti o i vostri figli eh, vogliano ehm, o siano interessati ad affrontare eh, l'argomento dell'esplorazione dello spazio e missioni nello spazio. Io non mi dilungo oltre, anche perché abbiamo un po' iniziato in ritardo a causa della, della gara ciclistica, quindi cedo molto volentieri la parola alla nostra relatrice. Angelique, thank you very much for being here with us today. It's an honor. Uh, and I'm glad that you accepted our invitation. So I will not uh, speak any further and I give you the floor. Perfect. Thank, thank you, you very much. Um, Buongiorno, good morning. Um, it's my pleasure to be here with you today, and I'm going to start with a fairly simple question. Who of you would like to go in space? Raise your hand. Okay, that's quite a significant amount of people. I'm going to ask the question again at the end of my talk and see if it changes either for the better or for the worse. So let's see where we, we get. Today I'm going to talk to you about humans in space and in particular why it's so difficult to eventually send humans to Mars and I'm going to talk to you about what we do from a science perspective, also a little bit from a technology perspective on how we try to make that possible eventually at, at some point. Um, so I work for the European Space Agency, and there we have a big program looking at human and robotic exploration. And it's important to highlight the two in combination, because those two elements will need to work very closely together if we ever want to bring uh, humans to Mars, which is, let's say, a high-level objective of ESA, but also of many other space agencies. If we look at the objectives the European Space Agency has, we, of course, start with the humans on Earth. You, me, everybody here. And this is really a critical element, and I will try to go a little bit more in detail in, in some of the slides that will come. We do human exploration in space, but a lot of those elements can also come back to Earth and be beneficial for, for you and for us, for patients on Earth, for applications. And this is always a very important element. Uh, Earth is also important because we use platforms here on Earth, analogs, and I will go into much more detail on that, where we try to simulate some of the very extreme environments that we have in space, and we use that also to research and to translate and, and take knowledge that will help us also further in, in space. The second element is, of course, humans uh, in low Earth orbit, as we call it. I think you've all heard about the International Space Station. It's 400 kilometers circling around the Earth above us, and for the last 20 years, more than 20 years, there have always been astronauts there. So if you come to think about it, for the last 20 years, Earth has never been complete, because there were always at least some humans in space uh, circling around, doing science, looking back at Earth, uh, and, and of course being in space there. The third element is the Moon. We've been to the moon as, as humankind, we have been there, but it's been a very long time ago, and of course, we want to go back. Um, so this is also an objective of ESA, we want to go back to the moon. Why? Because there is a lot to learn about, you know, from a fundamental science standpoint, um, but it also has important resources that could help us to venture further into space. Um, and it's an important element in preparing eventually for Mars. So, so this is why we also envisage going back to the Moon. And then the last element that you can see is, of course, eventually, and I stress the eventually because there's a lot of things we still need to do if we want to make that possible, is going to Mars. And that's going to be very challenging from a multitude of Im um, influences. And I'm going to talk to you today to try and give you an understanding that why, from a human perspective, this is so complicated um, and, and what we need to do to try and overcome that. 
I'm not going to go into detail on this slide, but I just want to show you that at the European Space Agency, and this is similar also for NASA and other space agencies, we have a multitude of platforms, but when we take the human in there, of course, we, we do a cross-cutting. We are, we are important from, a, from an astronaut perspective. We need to consider the human on all of these different uh, elements. Um, and again, the Human and Robotic Exploration Directorate has many studies, has many missions in preparation or ongoing on ground. And that's where I also want to focus a little bit with you today on low gravity platforms. I will also go a little bit more in detail on that. And then eventually we will also come to, to Moon and Mars, which for now from ESA side have been mostly robotic and, and non-crewed. But again, we are preparing for, for the future there. Okay, this is Samantha Cristoforetti, uh, Italian astronaut at the European Space Agency. Um, this was during her mission. I always like these images very much because they show, even being in space, that humans like to be very much connected to the Earth. You can see her here looking back at Earth, and that's also a key element that why, from a psychological standpoint, going to Mars will be very difficult, and I will come back to that uh, later. Now. Humans are not made to go in space. In general, life is not made to go in space. Space is a very hostile environment, and there are many elements there that make it very hard for life, and in particular also for humans, to, to, to thrive there. So as soon as you put a human in space, there will be a whole cascade of changes, of adaptation, of also sometimes unwanted changes that we need to try and understand to be able to mitigate or counteract. So that's always a critical element that we need to consider when we bring humans into space, especially if we do it for longer periods of time. Now, if we look at the, the main hazards, the main risk factors, then we can categorize them in five main hazards. And I'm going to walk you through each of them. Um, it's important to know this is far from an exhaustive list. There are many, many more. But from a human perspective, these are the most important ones and the ones we want to understand the best as we can, because we know they will be critical for bringing humans to Mars eventually. Let's start with the one that we actually know most about. This is the one we have studied for a very long time on the International Space Station, on, pr on missions before the International Space Station, and also to some extent on Earth. It's altered gravity. Here today, we are in a situation where, and actually we don't think about it, but we are constantly impacted by gravity. Gravity is working constantly in on our human body. If I jump here, gravity pulls me down. If I stumble, I fall to the ground. If I throw something up, it will fall to the ground. It's something that we don't consciously think about, unless we fall, of course, but it's something that's always there. So all of our physiology in our body has been made to work in a situation where the gravity is constantly there. Ever since the evolution of life on our planet, gravity has been always there. So as soon as we go to an environment where we change the gravity, of course, that's going to have a very big impact on a lot of different aspects. Now, when we think of a space mission, we will have altered gravity. What does that mean? So we start on Earth in the gravity situation that we are used to, and we go to a microgravity environment, sometimes close to zero gravity, meaning there will be no gravitational force working on our body. This has a huge impact, and, I, and I, I will talk to you a little bit more on, on some of the details on that. But when we think of space missions, we, for example, want to go to the lunar surface. The gravity there is roughly one-sixth one -sixth of, of what we have uh, here on Earth. So there is still some gravity, but it's, it's much smaller. And you might have seen from the Apollo movies, the astronauts jumping around on the lunar surface, of course, it's, it's a lot of fun to do that, but we need to understand what does that mean for our body, what does it mean for our physiology, and what do we need to do? Is, is that enough to keep functioning at a good level? Is it not enough? Uh, this is all the questions that we need to answer. 
And from a Mars perspective, it's the same there. On a Mars mission, when you land to the Martian surface, you will roughly have one third of what we have here on, on Earth. So all these elements need to be considered. And of course, if, if you put astronauts through a space mission, they will go from 1, gravi one g gravity on Earth to zero gravity to a fraction of the gravity we have, back in zero gravity and back to Earth. This is a lot for a human body to take. So we need to, to find tools, mechanisms to, to try and support the astronauts and keep them to, to a high level of performance. The second hazard is space radiation. This is a very important one, and it's one that we still do not have a lot of solutions for today. So a lot of the research we do at ESA, but also at NASA and the other space agencies, is looking to quantify what does space radiation mean for the astronauts, for humans, but also what can we do to shield and protect the astronauts from it. Basically, space radiation comes from high-energy particles coming from, uh, from the sun, but also from further uh, in, in the galaxy. Here on Earth, we are protected, but in space, we are not. Um, so as soon as you put astronauts in space, especially when you do that for longer periods of time, and especially if you do it further away from Earth, you will have some of these high-energy particles that can penetrate the spacecraft the astronauts are in, but they can also penetrate the human body. And it can be detrimental for DNA, and it can even damage our cells, which can then lead to cancer or other cardiovascular disease, brain disease, that of course is not something that we want for, for our astronauts. This is here, you can see this a little bit. Um, I mentioned here on Earth, we are protected by that. So the Earth has an electromagnetic field around it. You can see it in the blue lines. And you can see that it, it pushes away a little bit the radiation that we get from the sun. Now, of course, if we go away from Earth, for example, if we go to the moon or if we go to Mars, we will not have that protection anymore. So we need to find tools, either through shielding or to certain medication, to try and protect the astronauts from that as much as, as possible. The third hazard is something that you probably can all relate to, to some extent. Uh, remember the COVID pandemic? I think everybody still re remembers that very well. We were all isolated to some extent. Some people maybe more than others, but everybody can relate to the feeling of being closed, of being isolated, of not having a freedom to do what you want. Well, this is what astronauts also have in space. They are isolated. Um, they cannot just go to the cinema or go to a restaurant or have a drink with friends. They are isolated to some extent. And this, of course, again, if you do this for long periods of time, can have a, an impact on mental health, on mental well-being. And it's something we need to understand and we need to try and find solutions for. In the International Space Station, this is not so important because the astronauts are constantly in contact uh, with, uh, with Earth, so there's a lot of communication. But when we think of missions going further away, this will be very critical. And also, when you come to think about it, if we send astronauts on a mission, we pair them with four astronauts or, or six astronauts, depending on the mission. But these are people that they don't necessarily know. These are people that they don't necessarily like. It's not like you pick your best friends and, and you go with them to space. So also this introduces the complexity of having a team of people having to work together in a very extreme environment for a very long time. And this is also something that is going to be critically uh, important for, for upcoming missions. The fourth element is remoteness. Now, what does that mean, remoteness? It really means the distance to Earth. So, as I mentioned, the ISS is only 400 kilometers. That's not that far, if you come to think about it. Of course, it's not, you cannot just uh, step in your car and drive there, but just from the, the pure purpose of, of distance, it's actually not that far. There are places on Earth that are more remote than the ISS, uh, or, or let's say more difficult to access than the ISS. Now, when we go to the moon, and especially when we go to Mars, this is not the case. The distance will be huge. Astronauts will be more than 200 million kilometers away if we go to Mars, and there will be a huge impact of communication. There will be a delay, to some extent up to 20 minutes of delay, meaning 
I ask you a question, for example, my question on who wants to go to space, but then it will take 20 minutes for you to hear the question, and if you say, yes, I want to go, it will take another 20 minutes for me to hear, yes, I want to go. This is 40 minutes before we can just ask one simple yes or no question. So astronauts need to be very autonomous when they go to Mars, and we need to prepare them for that. We need to find tools that can support them to do it, also from a medical support uh, type of thing. And again, the communication I already mentioned, this is also going to be critically important. And, and one element I still want to mention here is we saw the picture of Samantha looking through the, the cupola on, on the International Space Station looking at Earth. If we go to Mars, Earth will just be a tiny spot in the sky. So we are really even physically disconnected from it. And emotionally, from, from a psychological standpoint, this can also have a huge impact on, on astronauts' mental well-being. So this is also something we need to consider. And then the last point I want to make is, especially if we consider um, Moon and Mars, is that these are extreme environments. So the Moon is an extreme environment, Mars is an extreme environment. There is, for example, a lot of dust that can be very complicated, it can mess with a lot of the technology we have, but also it can mess with our physiology. Um, so there's a lot of aspects there that we need to consider, and then also we have confined environments. For example, on Mars, astronauts will not be able to just go for a walk outside. If they want to do that, they will need to put on a spacesuit, and, and there's a lot of th stuff that comes with that. So we also need to, to consider that astronauts will be very confined in a habitat that we make for them. This, of course, also has impacts. Again, think of the COVID crisis that we had. Everybody was closed indoors. This is not the nicest feeling. Well, imagine doing that 200 million kilometers from Earth for two and a half years. So this, of course, has all of this has a lot of impact um, on, on what we need to prepare. This brings me to the f physiological changes. And I'm just going to focus on some, but from the image, you can already see that there is nearly no system in our body that is not impacted by space. Now, just quickly walking through it, we know the brain changes in space. We know the brain anatomically, structurally changes in space, but also how it works. This, of course, is maybe not the best thing if we want to send astronauts into space for three years. We know they are disorientated and that there is space motion sickness. So maybe some people get sick on a bus or in the car or on a train. Well, astronauts also get sick in space. So this is especially in the first days, this can really be a, a big impact. Um, we have vision changes, the eyes change and the function of the eyes change, especially for longer missions. This is also a risk. Imagine we send an astronaut two years to Mars, he arrives or she arrives there, and their vision is impacted. Well, we cannot just go to a shop and buy glasses to adjust for that, so these are all things that we need to, to take into account. Respiratory changes, I talked about the dust that we will have on, on the Moon and on Mars. Well, this can interfere with the normal function of lungs, and we need to understand how that happens. We've already done some research into that, but also the dust potentially can be toxic for humans if we inhale it. Also, this is something that we want to understand better and, and to protect the astronauts from. Cardiovascular changes, I, I come back to that in a second. There can be kidney stones because we have a, a, a different, let's say, cascade of, of calcium. Um, I don't know if anybody here already had a kidney stone. On Earth, this is not pleasant at all and, and can be actually an emergency, but of course, we have a good uh, medical support network here. In space, this can be really critical if this happens, especially if astronauts are on their way to Mars. So something that might be standard here on Earth and that we can easily treat is not like that at all in space. Um, we have muscle atrophy. What does that mean? So the muscles will become much smaller, they will become less strong, so they basically lose mass and they lose strength. This is, is very simple. If I take a heavy bag here, I'm basically using my muscles, or if I take a weight and I'm using my muscles, I'm working in against gravity. If there is no gravity, my muscles will not be triggered, so basically they will lose 
they will lose their strength, they will lose their function. This is not so much an issue as long as the astronaut stays in space, but as soon as they come back to Earth or in a situation where there is gravity, they will struggle. Same with the bones. Bones need gravity to have a good balance between uh, bone, let's say, the, the new formation of bone and bone resorption. If we, if we don't have that good balance, then bones will become more, uh, less dense. They become less dense, they become weaker, they have a higher risk of fractures. This, again, is very important if you're going to land on Mars. Here on Earth, if the astronauts land, there is a big committee for them to, to help them get, in, uh, get out of the vehicle. They support them from a medical perspective. They are very well taken care of. If we land on Mars, at least to our knowledge, there will be nobody. So this is also something that we need to plan for and we need to try and, and prepare for. And then you can see on, on the site, there's a whole range of other things that are impacted. And all of that can have an impact on their physiological performance, but also on their mental. For example, sleep disturbances. The day-night cycle is completely disrupted in space. This has an impact. If anybody ever had a jet lag, this impacts how you function. In space, this is constant. Uh, on the International Space Station, Astronauts see uh, 16 sunrises and sunsets every day. 16, one six. So imagine how that plays with, with your day-night cycle. So these are all elements that we need to consider, and I just want to go a little bit more in detail on some of them. Please ignore the graph, it's very complicated. Just look at the colors of the lines. And what I want to just show you is that some of these changes happen in the beginning. So as soon as an astronaut goes into space, they are very acute, but then they, they balance out. Some of these changes are, are not at all important if you do a shorter mission, but they become exponentially important as the astronaut spends longer time in space. So there's always this balance between the more acute things we need to try and counteract and between the things that might be cumulative, so adding up as longer the duration of the mission is. And again, this is something that we need to take into account. You see a red line there. This is for the eyes, for the vision. You can see that going up. Uh, there's also lines for, for uh, body mass and for bone. You can also see that going up. So meaning, the longer we stay in space, the more impact this will have. Then you see some other stuff that peaks at the beginning and then stabilizes. That's, for example, the motion sickness that I was talking about. This peaks in the beginning, but then the brain adjusts to it and everything is fine. It just becomes an issue again when you bring the astronauts back to Earth. Um, one thing I just want to talk about is fluid distribution. Now, if everything goes well, we have a situation where you can see that we have an evenly fluid distribution in our body, unless there's a certain disease which can happen. As soon as you bring astronauts into space, this will not be the case, because on the one hand, we have the muscles bringing the fluids up, and we have the, the heart pumping the, the fluids around, and we have gravity pulling it down. There's a good balance between that. If you take out the gravity, what will happen is, of course, you will have more fluid in the upper part of your body, in particular in the head. This is something that we think causes the vision changes that we see, and we think it also causes headaches that the astronauts have, but also the brain changes that I was talking about. These are two astronauts, Scott Kelly and Mikhail Kornienko. They spent a year in space, and you can see them wearing a, a, you know, a 300 days in space. Look at their faces. They are very swollen. This is how the astronauts actually look like when they are on Earth. So I'm just going to put it next to each other. Can, can you see how swollen their head is? It's, it's almost like it's going to explode. This is what happens when you stay a long time in space. So it's very, it's very unpleasant, it's very uncomfortable. It also makes that they don't taste their food to the same extent, because there is congestion. Um, it makes that they can have headaches. And as I already mentioned, it can impact their vision, and it can impact some of the brain changes that we see. This was just one example, because I think this is very clearly visual of, of what, what is the impact. I also talked about disorientation and the space motion sickness. If I ask you what is up and down in this picture, then probably you will tell me this is up and this is down. Now, in space, there is no up and down. It could be also the other way around. 
So of course, you can imagine that this has a big impact on how astronauts orient themselves in the environment that they are, and this plays with their, with their sense of orientation, with their spatial awareness, and can cause, to motion, it can cause motion sickness, as I mentioned, especially in the beginning. Um, just one thing I also want to highlight, the video is going to play in, in the background, but astronauts need to exercise a lot. They exercise two and a half hours every day. Now, I also like exercise myself, but two and a half hours every day is maybe a little bit too excessive for me as well. Now, why do they do that? It's to counteract the muscle loss that they will have. It's to counteract the loss of density in the bones to the extent that we can. So they need to do a lot of different types of exercise, either cardiovascular, but also um, resistive uh, exercise. And this is really a critical component, but it takes two and a half hours every day. This is a huge chunk of their time on the ISS. So imagine that we send them to a mission to Mars. Maybe we need to even increase that. But this makes it, of course, very difficult. And on top of that, because they exercise so much, they consume a lot of calories. And if you consume a lot of calories, I don't know for you, I get very hungry. So it means you need to eat more. Um, it means that we need to send more food into space, which is not so straightforward, because it's, it costs a lot of money to send food into space. And if we think of a mission to Mars, we need to have the, the food there for a very long period of time, so it needs to stay healthy, it needs to keep its nutrients. And also, that is not so straightforward. So we need to think of other tools and other mechanisms to optimize um, counteracting uh, muscle and, and bone loss in space. Um, just quickly su summarizing a little bit, also coming to the hazards. At the European Space Agency, we focus our research on, on five big uh, focus areas when it comes to astronauts. So, of course, we have physiology and everything that changes in the body. We have behavioral health, so that's the mental well-being, but also sleep, its cognition, and trying to understand that. Um, okay, radiation, we've, we've talked about uh, and, and protecting the astronauts from that. We look into science and technology for habitation. Remember, astronauts will need to live in habitats uh, when they go to, to Mars or to, to the moon even. Uh, so we look into life support systems. We look into recycling systems. But we also look into microbiology um, because you know you need to contain and, and we know that we can, for example, get mold or we can get biofilm formation in space. So we need to counteract that as well. And then we look at medical capabilities, and that's really aiming at technologies to make the astronauts autonomous from a medical perspective when they go into space. Again, this, it, these are the platforms that we have, and now I just want to zoom in on some of these platforms to give you a little bit of a feeling why we do science also here on Earth. Um, first, I come to the International Space Station. We have a lot of different activities. We run a really you know, multidisciplinary research program. We have physical sciences research, we have biology research, and we have human research on the International Space Station. When we look at the human health um, activities, we look at aging. Uh, space is a very good model for aging. And generally speaking, you also need to realize that it's very interesting from a scientific perspective. Because here on Earth, we of course look into certain diseases, for example, think of osteoporosis. This is a disease where you lose uh, the density of your bones and you have a higher risk of fracture, for example. What we do when we do research into that here on Earth is we have a group of healthy people and we have a group of patients with osteoporosis and we compare them with each other and we do research. But usually we only get the patient group after they have developed the disease. We only can do research on them once we know, ah yes, you, we have a patient here with this disease. If you think of astronauts, it's very different because we have a very healthy individual before they go in space, then we put them in a super complex, stressful, challenging, hostile environment, and then we bring the, the same individual back to Earth. So actually we can follow them all along the way. From a physiological and biomedical standpoint, and from a science perspective, this is very, very interesting. We don't have that capacity very often. And this can also really help us to 
understand better how certain physiological changes on Earth or certain disease processes, we can map it into space because we know the astronauts go through something similar. And this can help us also for, for patients on Earth. So again, we just have a, I just wanted to show that we have a whole range of, of signs that we do uh, on the ISS to look into these different uh, aspects. Um, one thing I just want to briefly talk about, and this is more like a future capacity, so one thing that we are looking into at ESA and we're actually building a, a device that will fly uh, to space to help us is 3D bioprinting. So basically it is printing cells and tissues with a printer. Uh, it's, it's something that you might have heard already here on, on Earth, but we can also do it, or we're trying to do it now in space, it has been done before. And this can be very valuable for two reasons. One, it can help us to do more fundamental research in trying to understand how biology changes in space in comparison to, of course, the astronauts that we fly. But it can also help us maybe to, and this is really uh, more future work. For example, here you see a 3D bioprinted bone, but you could also consider it can have applications. For example, imagine you're on a mission to Mars and an astronaut gets a, a, a skin wound or, or a burn wound. Eventually, this is more future term, but maybe we can print some skin using cells of the astronaut and use that to treat uh, the, the burn wound. So those are things that we are really trying to look into. Again, this is really future planning, future thinking. It's not like we're going to do that anytime soon. But this is what we are trying to build slowly the capa capability to, to do so. Um, this is just one experiment I wanted to highlight. It's also an Italian experiment. Um, but this is very interesting as well. So this is um, an experiment that really took wounds. They took skin uh, from patients here on Earth. They flew it into space and they made sutures. So they basically had a surgery done in space on these little patches of skin. And they looked at the healing process of the skin, of the wound healing. And what we have seen is that the wound healing process in microgravity is different than on Earth. And it's actually, it's, it's suboptimal. So also this is something that we need to study to understand from a fundamental standpoint to try and then counteract to prepare our astronauts on these, these long-term missions. Um, another experiment, this is actually one that I've, that I've done research on myself, is looking at the brain in space. So what you can see here is an image. It's going through the brain, so it's going like this. So you start at the eyes, and then it goes through the brain like this. And you can see all these very nice colors, but these colors basically show the different connections in the brain. So um, the green color is showing connections going from the front of the brain to the back. The red color is showing uh, connections from left to right, and then the blue color is showing connections up to down. For example, uh, connections from the brain uh, influencing our muscles, for example. What we have seen in space is that there are changes in how the brain is connected, but there are also changes in how the brain is structured. And we actually see, in some instances, very big differences. Um, we also have something called you know, fluid compartments in the brain, and you can see that in the image here in, in the middle. So here you see these, these black holes, that's basically fluid. We know that when an astronaut comes back from space, there is a huge increase in fluid in these compartments. And that, of course, is linked to also the fluid distribution that I talked to you about earlier, more fluid in, in the upper head. But what's interesting is that even six months after coming back from space, we still see an increased fluid in the brain. And this is something that today we don't know yet if it's permanent, and we don't know yet if it really impacts the astronaut, but it's of course something we need to try and understand better. Just one thing I want to mention is that it's not because we measure a change that it necessarily has an impact. So imagine that I have my two arms, and maybe if this arm tomorrow is two millimeters shorter, if I have the right tools to measure that, I can tell everybody, yes, we measured uh, that you know, this arm is two millimeters shorter or became two millimeters shorter. 
but maybe it will not harm me in still using the RM in the same capacity. So this is something that we always need to have a little bit also as a reflection. It's not because we measure change that it necessarily has an impact. And from a human space exploration standpoint, we only care about the changes that really have an impact, because that's the one that we need to target to try and mitigate. Um, astronauts are very lovely. Uh, we like to test them. They're very unique. But unfortunately, there are not a lot of them. Uh, so we don't always have the ideal science case where we can test a lot of astronauts and then make very strong conclusions. Uh, also, there's a lot of differences between the astronauts. So to try and counteract that limitation, we also do science here on Earth in platforms or analogs, as we call it, that simulates certain aspects of, of space. So one I want to talk to you about first is bed rest. That sounds very good, resting in a bed. I think everybody likes that uh, to some extent. But what we do with these people is we put them in bed for 60 days, six, zero, two months. And they need to stay in bed for the whole period of two months. They cannot come out, they cannot come up. And it's even worse, we don't only put them in bed for two months, we also tilt their head. So if this is the bed, we do like this, with their head here, and their legs are upwards. Why do we do that? Because if we, if we do it like this, we will have more fluid going to the upper part of the body, as we've already talked about. And because they don't move for two months, they are immobilized. Their muscles will get weaker, their bones will get weaker, and we induce a similar process as what we see in space. The good thing about this is that we can test much more people, so we can, we can do a lot of testing. Of course, it's easier to access. We can use more state-of-the-art technology. For example, if we want to look at the brain and we want to do a brain scan, we cannot send an MRI scanner into space, but we can test these people in an MRI scanner. So these are things that, that help us. Um, and we can also look at tools, techniques. We can test exercise regimes. We can test supplements that people can take, and we can see the effectiveness of them before we try them in space. Uh, one example I want to give you is something we are doing right now. We have a study in Slovenia looking at artificial gravity. So we spin the astronauts on, a, uh, or let's say the subjects, on a centrifuge. And while they do that, they are exercising. And here you can see a video. Uh, this is actually me on, on the centrifuge. And this is what we do now in Slovenia. So we have 24 people lying in bed. And a part of them is doing this every day for 30 minutes, for half an hour. So we spin them, and we let them do exercise to see whether this can mitigate some of the unwanted changes that we see if we put people in bed for 60 days. Because if it helps, then maybe this is something we could eventually do in space. Another model, very briefly, this is not a bed, but it's a, a bathtub uh, where we put people in. Uh, we've done it for five days, and we are now going to do a study for 10 days. Um, but because you put them in this water, uh, you can also s uh, introduce similar physiological changes as what we see in space. There is going to be a fluid redistribution. Uh, there is no force in, in the water working on their body, so they also lose muscle. It's very unpleasant, uh, but it's a very good tool also to do research and to test certain countermeasures. We've talked about the psychological component. For that, we do simulations. So we, we put people, we simulate that they are isolated and confined and that they are doing a space mission. And uh, we, from ESA, are going to run a study here uh, next year for 100 days, so 100. But we have also worked, for example, with our Russian colleagues, where we have isolated people for more than one year. So we really put people, six people, into a confined environment into a, you know, a habitat, and they mimic like they are on a mission to Mars. So they have reduced communication, they have a very monotonous schedule that they need to follow. Uh, and this, of course, also is a very good tool to, to try and test the psychological impact. One big drawback is that as good as we make it, people know it's a simulation they know they are still on Earth and that they can technically open the door at any point and just come back to the, real, uh, to the reality. This is a, a, a big drawback that we have with these uh, simulations. 
And that's why we also use, uh, use platforms that are really high fidelity, meaning they are real extreme environments. One example is the biomedical research station at Concordia. It's uh, owned by the French and the Italian polar uh, institutes. Um, they every year do a winter over campaign where you have a crew of roughly 12 people who stay there for one year. And during the winter, the station is not accessible. It's actually more remote than the ISS. So if they have a medical emergency in the winter, they need to survive on their own. They need to fix it on their own. Every year, ESA sends a medical doctor there who runs a variety of biomedical studies looking at team dynamics, looking at mental health and well-being, looking at cognition, and also looking at some physiological adaptation, for example, from the immune system. So this is a very good tool for us to complement with the previous simulations uh, that we do. Then I just want to briefly touch on another platform. It's, it's fairly different. So we, we have also gravity platforms, or let's say low gravity platforms. And one tool is parabolic flights. And I don't know if you've heard about it, but just very briefly, we use a, a normal plane. And I will show you a video later. It flies a, a normal flight, so 1G. And then it pulls up to an angle of roughly 45 degrees. And by doing so, it will counteract all the forces that are there making that the resulting force is going to be zero on the plane and everything in it. And by doing so, we can actually test in a microgravity environment, so at the top of the parabola, we can do some research into acute effects in microgravity, or we can test some tools that we want to, to test. Then the plane comes down again. Um, actually, during the, the time it goes up or down, we, we experience more gravity, and then it resumes. During one parabolic flight, we do 31 of these parabolas, so 3-1. Uh, and we usually fly three days subsequently, so this gives then researchers enough time in microgravity to, to, do, their, uh, to do their research. Just want to show you a little bit. This is the plane that we use. Oh, sorry. I'm just going to go back. Don't know if it works. No, the video is too big. Wait, I show you this then. Uh, this is my colleague who runs the parabolic flights for us. And what you can see here is it, you can see four different levels of gravity. Uh, you have lunar gravity, which is, as I mentioned, one sixth of what we have here on Earth. We can fly Martian gravity, roughly one third of what we have here on Earth. We have Earth gravity. And here you can also see the, the double gravity, which is when the, the plane goes up and down. This is very interesting because the parabolic flight, even though it has many limitations from a physiological standpoint, we can do some actual research into microgravity and, and to better understand that. And this is the only platform where we can actually test humans on, apart from, of course, going to the International uh, Space Station. Um, now, again, given that we, during one parabola, we only have roughly 20 seconds of microgravity or lunar and, and Martian gravity, so it's not something to look at things that really need a long time to evolve. We've talked about the bone, for example, that it needs a long time. We've talked about vision. This is not something that we're going to be able to test in a parabolic flight. But for example, the disorientation and the space motion sickness, knowing it peaks really at the beginning, this is, this, these are things that we can actually test. And it's also being used to uh, train astronauts, for example, before they go into space with certain procedures they need to do. Uh, or it's used to test technology as a proof of concept before we then fly it in, in space to look at certain aspects there. Um, we've talked about the moon and going back to the moon. Of course, we want to go back to the surface, but we also are working together with with ESA, NASA, the Canadian Space Agency, and the Japanese Space Agency in having a station that will orbit uh, the moon, very similar to what the ISS is, is doing right now around Earth. Uh, this is an interesting station from a human perspective as well, because sometimes there will be crew there. And we can actually look or do research in particularly looking at the radiation impact on, on the human body. Remember that this is something that, especially if you go into deep space, is going to be really critical, really important. So this is actually a station where we can really dig into a little bit more of the effects. 
the crew will there be there for shorter periods, but it's the first time we will actually get them in this deep space environment. And that element of radiation is not something we can look into easily uh, on the ISS because it's still in this protective electromagnetic field uh, from the Earth. One last point I just want to make, this is really more future, it's a little bit sci-fi, but we are also looking into, for really, really long-term application, uh, hibernation. Uh, so, so hibernating the astronauts, for example, for a trip to Mars. Um, we know that mammals do hibernation, and you can see an example there of a brown bear, and we've actually already studied quite some of the mechanisms. But basically what these bears do when they hibernate is that they lower their metabolism. They, they lower it to a huge extent. And we think, and there are uh, indications for that, because the brown bears are, are very similar when it comes to, uh, they're not similar, but they are, let's say, at a higher uh, order, similar to body weight and the ratio. We think it might be possible to introduce something similar in, in humans. And we have seen from rodent research, so from mice and rats, uh, that we can introduce this lower metabolism, this torpor, as we call it, also in animals that don't naturally hibernate. For example, rats, they don't naturally hibernate. Squirrels, for example, they do. And we know that we can introduce it in, in rats. Why is this interesting? Well, one, we know that when bears hibernate for a long period of time, they have a protective mechanism for keeping their muscles uh, you know, even though they don't move for a very long time, or almost not. This, of course, is something that would be very interesting to apply uh, in space. And also the radiation, we've tested uh, animals that are in hibernation in torpor. They seem to be four times more protected into the damage that radiation can do. So this is, of course, also something that, that would be interesting for us. And then the last component is the psychological component, because a trip to Mars is going to be very boring. Um, imagine that you go on a holiday and you, you get in the car and you drive somewhere, but you drive for eight months. You need to drive for eight months. You cannot get out of the car to stop at the gas station or something like that. This is very boring. I mean, of course, we're, the astronauts are going to need to do some research, but if we could mitigate that by having them hibernate for certain periods of the trip, this mentally could also have a, a more positive impact. And then lastly, because they hibernate and their metabolism will be lower, we need to give them less food. And as I already mentioned, this would also be interesting because anything we need to send is mass. Mass is expensive. It makes it much more complicated. So the more we can reduce that, uh, the better. That was my last slide. I, I want to thank you very much uh, for your attention. It was a pleasure to speak here to you. And I look forward also to, to maybe engaging a bit more with you in questions. Just one last thing I want to mention is I also uh, write books, in particular for kids. And I had the privilege of having my last book translated in Italian. So if somebody has an interest in science, there's also a chapter on space, then please feel free to, to have a look. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Angelique. Grazie per questa presentazione interessantissima. Um, è abbastanza curioso che quando uh, frequentai l'International Space University nel 1999, <laughs> um, ci fecero esattamente la stessa domanda che tu hai fatto al pubblico all'inizio della tua conferenza. Era più precisa, ci chiesero quanti di voi eravamo circa 100 studenti provenienti da tutto il mondo, ci dissero quanti di voi andrebbero in una missione su Marte. E ovviamente, essendo tutti degli space enthusiasts, tutti alzammo la mano, inclusa la sottoscritta. E però non abbiamo ancora fatto la domanda. Dopo, la, dopo il corso rifecero la stessa domanda e dobbiamo ancora rifare la stessa domanda al pubblico. Ma prima di questo, potresti dirci Qual è la cosa che tu ritieni più pericolosa di una missione su Marte per gli umani? Yeah. Maybe before I do that, I want to check who would actually still go to space after hearing about all of this. Okay, there's still some hands, definitely less than when I asked in the beginning, 
But for those of you that still have their hand raised, please keep an eye out when we do a new astronaut uh, selection at the European Space Agency. Per um, vostra informazione, dopo il nostro corso di diritto dello spazio all'International Space University, ci fu soltanto uno uh, coraggioso che alzò la mano per andare su una missione su, Mars, tutti, su Marte. Tutti gli altri, inclusa me stessa, avevamo già cambiato idea. <laughs> Uh, Ilaria, to come to your question, what is the, the most important risk? Um, I think there's two. Uh, one is the radiation, as I mentioned. This is really something we don't understand yet very well, and that we know can be really, really detrimental for the health of astronauts, especially if, if we think of a long mission to Mars. So that's something that we are ramping up our research, our science, into really better understanding that, and again, trying to find tools to protect the astronauts better, shielding, nutraceuticals, medication, uh, and, and so on. Um, and the second element, it's the one I find most interesting, is the human component, and in particular, the psychological health. Why? Because this is not an exact science. Uh, it's really difficult to, to quantify. It's really difficult to predict how humans will react in certain situations. Of course, we try to select that when we, we select for astronauts. We, we try to look for people who are mentally very stable, who are flexible, who can cope very strongly. But even then, you don't know how they will react when they are exposed to such an extreme environment. So for me, those are the two most critical things that we really need to dig into deeper uh, in the future. And ESA, l'Agenzia Spaziale Europea, attualmente sta lavorando in maniera concreta soprattutto su una futura missione sulla Luna in collaborazione con la NASA. Ma eh, quindi abbiamo già insomma delle prospettive per quanto riguarda il nostro satellite, invece quando pensi che saremo pronti per andare eh, sul pianeta rosso? Quanto tempo ci vorrà ancora? This is very difficult. Um, you see Elon Musk, for example, talking about, oh yeah, we're going to go to Mars and we're going to build, you know, a society there. And I think this is, I mean, okay. Usually when Elon Musk says something, he also does it, so we always need to be a bit uh, careful with that. But I think there's a difference between doing it and doing it ethically, safely. Um, and of course, as agencies, as ESA, NASA, we have a duty to do it in an ethical manner and to do it in a safe manner. And I think that's really important. Um, we keep talking about the 2040s, uh, which and I speak as Angelique Vandenberger here, not as Isa, I think is, is, is too soon. There's too many things that we still need to prepare, things that we don't know. I'm not so much worried about the technology, uh, because you know we can sometimes go very quick on that. Uh, but it, again, you have s the human element is so complicated that I, I think it will be very tricky. Uh, of course, it's important to, to, to try and reach for, for that objective but it might slip uh, into a little bit later, yeah. Mi chiedo se ci sono delle domande dal pubblico, immagino ce ne saranno tante perché l'argomento che ha presentato Angelique von Ombergen oggi è molto interessante, quindi prego. Salve, innanzitutto grazie per la conferenza. E volevo chiedere come sono organizzati, dopo il ritorno degli astronauti sulla Terra, gli eventuali corsi di riabilitazione, perché alcuni astronauti tornano e, per esempio, lasciano le cose per aria perché credono ancora che ci sia la microgravità. Quindi, più o meno, quanto tempo ci vuole per ritornare alle condizioni normali sulla Terra? Grazie. Yeah. Um, that's a, a very good question. Um, so as I mentioned during the talk, when astronauts come back to Earth, there is a very strong, big medical team taking care of them. I mean, you have doctors, you have physiotherapists, so they are really well taken care of. How long it takes depends also on the astronaut, because we see a strong individual difference. Um, astronaut A and B will not react in the same way and will not come back in the same condition. We've even had astronauts, this is exceptional, that are fitter when they come back to Earth. Uh, these are <laughs> really the exceptions, I would say. Um, exactly. Yeah. <laughs> exactly. Um, but 
Okay, in most cases, they do follow a rehabilitation scheme. This is mostly focused on, on bone and muscle uh, to try and get them stronger again. And of course, by being on Earth itself and having gravity impact again, a, a lot of uh, things will also come naturally. Uh, so it's hard to give you a concrete number because it really depends on the astronaut. And we know also for some of the, ch the changes that I mentioned, um, people react differently, but we also sometimes see differences between female astronauts and male astronauts. So that's also something to take into account because, of course, physiologically, they are sometimes slightly different. Yeah. Ho visto un'altra mano alzata qui poco fa. Ah, ok. Altre domande? Io avrei ancora una domanda mentre magari qualcuno trova il coraggio di alzare la mano ed è eh, quali sono le ricadute, eh, tu, tu ci hai mostrato tutti gli esperimenti che vengono fatti eh, sulla Stazione Spaziale Internazionale, in particolare anche a Terra. Uno potrebbe chiedersi ma se tanto non riusciamo ad andare sulla Luna o su Marte nel prossimo futuro a cosa serve tutto questo? oltre a prepararci per le missioni future. Ci sono delle ricadute anche per noi esseri umani sulla Terra da tutta questa ricerca scientifica che noi facciamo all'Agenzia Spaziale Europea? Yeah. I think that's a very important topic and for ESA itself it's also important to always reflect on that. Now, of course, some of the science we do, we really do it with the first priority to help the astronauts. But a lot of the science we do can actually come back to Earth. And I, I just want to give a few examples. I, I touched on one example uh, during, during my presentation, which is the, the bone density loss. We, have, we know this occurs in space. And by being able to test an astronaut before, during, and after that physiological change, we can get a better understanding of the, the fundamental uh, difference, or let's say the fundamental science. And if we understand that better, it's also much easier to, to target therapeutics, uh, to, to target it. So that's one example. Now, bone is one, one thing, but also muscle. Um, we, we know the astronauts lose their muscle mass, muscle strength. There are conditions on Earth where we have something similar, sarcopenia, but also for elderly people, immobilized people. Uh, space is a very good model to, to look into that. And again, some of the tools that we use in space to counteract might be then applicable also for people on Earth. Um, another example, and, and this is really key more to the microgravity environment, something that we try to understand is how, this is very different from what I just discussed, but a tumor, for example, how the metastasis happens. Now, on Earth, in labs, this is very difficult to, to replicate. Um, whereas, if you go into a microgravity uh, environment, you can much more easily understand the fundamentals of how a tumor can metas uh, do the metastasis. And if we do that, again, it becomes a tool to better target certain uh, cancer treatments. So, these are, for example, some more applied research that, that we do in space. Um, okay, this is more a bit less linked to astronauts, but some of the technology that we need is, for example, recycling. We need to recycle on Earth, uh, sorry, in space, we need to recycle the water, and it needs to be of a very, very high level because water is, is very precious. So we have, um, you know, optimized the recycling tools that we have, for example, on board of the ISS. And we, of course, bring that back to applications to make also more sustainable uh, impact uh, on Earth. And actually, I showed you the research station at Antarctica. We already are implementing some of the stuff we do in space. We also have a, a test bed there for gray water recycling. And just one last thing I want to mention is that a lot of the technology we develop for space is that it needs to be small. It needs to be not so heavy. It needs to be autonomous. And of course, this also helps in pushing the technology development that can then also uh, be beneficial for Earth in miniaturized design or maybe even applications for telemedicine, because we have that, uh, yeah. Infatti, ci sono molte, molte applicazioni di origine spaziale che noi 
utilizziamo sulla terra e che sono state anche proprio progettate per, per consentire eh, di portare una massa più importante o piuttosto di ridurre la massa aumentando il volume di quello che possiamo portare nello spazio, ma penso che l'esempio che Angelica ha fatto sul riciclo dell'acqua sia, sia molto importante, avrà delle ricadute molto importanti sulla terra, soprattutto laddove c'è carenza eh, idrica e quindi le risorse, la risorsa d'acqua deve essere eh, riutilizzata, come succede sulla Stazione Spaziale Internazionale. Prego, visto che c'è un'altra domanda. Buongiorno. Eh, considerando che in passato cioè persone astronauti sono stati sulla Luna, eh, è perché non si erano posti il problema o perché avevano usato delle tecniche magari primordiali per mitigare le radiazioni nello spazio e in particolare per uscire dalle fasce di Van Allen. Grazie. Grazie per la domanda. Yeah, that's a very good question. Um, there's two things I want to mention. One is Apollo, of course, happened a very long time ago. It was a different era. It was, a, it was really... And I'm not saying that is not the case anymore today, but it was really a very... I think the risk margin that they had was less than what we need to work with today. So I think from a general perspective, they were really pushing hard to, to, to be the first ones from the American side to bring uh, humans to the lunar surface. So, I mean, everything worked well, but in the preparation, there were a lot of things that went wrong as well. Um, so that's something to consider that we are a little bit in a different era when it comes to the risk margin that we need to have. Again, coming also to the safe and, and ethical aspect of, of bringing astronauts into space. Um, also noting that the Apollo missions were very, very short. Uh, so that's also something that, of course, they had a higher exposure. Um, and, and there has been some research into that, more anecdotal, because we didn't have a huge amount of astronauts going, and also the technologies and the understanding of the space environment were slightly different than what we have today. But they were very short. So as long as, I mean, as, long as you keep it very short, the risk, especially longer term, is, is also minimal. It's more when you make the missions longer that really it becomes uh, more critical. So I think, of course, we will build this incrementally. We will go with shorter missions and then you know, expand them and make them longer. And we need to also build the knowledge uh, based on, on that uh, scheme. So, yeah. Prego. C'è un'altra domanda? Ah, OK, aspetta, c'è una domanda, ah, una domanda là in fondo. Prima. Um, lei è mai stata nello spazio e come si diventa un astronauta? No. <laughs> uh, I have not been in space, but I have yet. done the... Yet. the yeah, yet. Well, yet. I, I don't know. <laughs> um, but I have done the parabolic flight. It was a very nice experience to, to you know, experience microgravity. Um, it's, it's very unique. It's, it's very... I cannot really explain how it, how it feels. It's, it's a very nice so, uh, a feeling. So the idea of doing that for a long period of time must be nice. It's a bit relaxing even. Um, how can you become an astronaut? That's a good question. I think today you see many more people going into space who don't necessarily have the uh, traditional career paths of astronauts who are you know, either fighter jet pilots or engineers or scientists. So we see that there is much more diversity. Um, when you ask from the ESA perspective, of course, we are really looking for people uh, who are physically very fit, mentally very fit, and who have a scientific technical uh, background. Um, we have in 2021 released a new astronaut uh, selection. We had 24,000 applications, and we have now selected a pool of, of 17 uh, astronauts in total, five career and 12 reserve. So, yeah, we're trying to bring those people into space, but if, if you have an interest, please keep your eyes open because there will for sure be future uh, application rounds. E a questo proposito invito, ti invito, invito tutti a visitare il sito web dell'Agenzia Spaziale Europea www.esa.int come internazionale e lì trovate anche tutte le informazioni, le vacancy notice anche per altri, per, per esempio per i nostri giovani abbiamo dei programmi di young graduate trainee 
che permettono ai giovani quindi di iniziare una, um, un percorso di, 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 di lavoro, un, un percorso professionale in ESA, poi abbiamo anche degli stage, quindi vi invito a guardare il sito e poi sul sito ci sono tante informazioni interessanti che riguardano lo spazio a 360 gradi, non solo per quel che riguarda la medicina, la fisiologia degli astronauti nello spazio, ma anche l'osservazione della Terra, la scienza, le telecomunicazioni, la navigazione via satellite che ci consente oggi col telefonino di vedere dove stiamo andando per le strade, insomma lo spazio è non solo spazio extraatmosferico rivolto verso l'universo, ma è anche spazio che, dalla, dallo, che guarda verso la Terra, quindi noi con i nostri satelliti osserviamo il pianeta e lo monitoriamo. Quindi ci sono anche molte informazioni utili sui cambiamenti climatici, sul riscaldamento dei mari, eh, quindi ecco, andate a fare un, un giro sul sito dell'ESA che è molto interessante. C'era ancora una domanda qui avanti, abbiamo ancora qualche minuto? Grazie. Sì, mi interessavano le dinamiche psicologiche del, del team che doveva affrontare una missione nello spazio così lungo. Volevo sapere se esiste il, un, can, un profilo psicologico, uno solo ideale, o dipende dal numero del, delle persone nel gruppo. E la seconda domanda è se si pensa già un, a, un, a una proporzione ideale tra il numero di donne e di uomini nella missione. Io posso rispondere parzialmente alla domanda dicendo che quando, ci fecero la, quando seguì il corso dell'International Space University chiesero quale potesse essere l'equipaggio ideale per un volo su Marte e purtroppo gli, i legali, gli avvocati, no, non li volevano, hanno detto no. Quindi io non, non avrei avuto comunque nessuna chance. Per quelli che non lo sanno, io sono un legale dell'ESA, non sono uno, uno scienziato. Quindi lascio la parte, la parte jokes a parte, lascio la, la parola a Angelique per la risposta seria. Yeah, so it's a very good question. It's one we don't have an answer to yet. Um, now, of course, when you ask about the psychological profile of an astronaut, they need to be mentally stable, they need to be mentally flexible, because that's also important. Things can always change. I give you an example. We had the Boeing crew, Starliner, you might have heard, they were supposed to go to space for eight days. They will now be there for eight months. If you're not mentally stable and not mentally flexible, this is very hard to, to deal with. Eh? So um, I think this is very important. And for short missions on the ISS in the past, this is not so much of an issue. But it really comes when you think of the long term, you know, the two, three years types of things, then this becomes really important. Um, we don't have yet the answer of what the ideal crew composition is because it depends also on the mission. What we do know, of course, is that a crew to Mars will be multicultural, it will be international, we will have female-male components, so there, there's a, I mean, it will be very diverse. So at ESA, but also at NASA, we are really studying now those types of aspects. So for example, the isolation study that I mentioned, We want to have a, an international crew. We will have a mix between male and uh, female crew. And to look at those dynamics is, is really uh, important to, to plan. And again, it's not an exact science. We are never going to know or cover all the elements before we actually do the missions. But we need to try and understand it as, as good as possible. And then we will always take a, a risk on it and, and, and try to then cope with it when, once it comes to a potential issue. Yeah. But as a compliment, la, la NASA um, fa un assessment degli astronauti ogni volta che tornano uh, su Terra. Ci sono dei file ben precisi in cui viene definito il comportamento dell'astronauta, un po' come a scuola, e quindi se, se sei adatto o meno per ripartire per un'altra missione ehm, e se, per un, o, o per missioni di lunga durata. Questo ce lo raccontava forse in una delle scorse conferenze, se non ricordo male, proprio Simonetta Di Pippo, che è stata la direttrice dei voli umani eh, tempo fa all'Agenzia Spaziale Europea. Abbiamo ancora qualche minuto per qualche domanda, prego. Vorrei sapere se esiste un caso che possa essere raccontato di una situazione di crisi eh, in un contesto di una missione spaziale nel, nel contesto del team degli astronauti che, e, e come sia stato risolto eh, e che cosa si è imparato da questa situazione, se, se si è verificato, se si può raccontare. Crisi tecnica o crisi psicologica? 
crisi psicologica sicuramente sarebbe interessante perché crisi tecnica credo che andiamo un po' troppo nello specifico per riuscire a magari a, a raccontarcela però mh, se, se c'è un caso comunque interessante che possa essere raccontato per, e cosa si è imparato poi come si è affrontato e come, come si è imparato grazie it's a very good question um, it's hard to give an example because not always all the issues that have are communicated for obvious reasons. There is always a confidentiality aspect. And as Ilaria mentioned, the astronauts go through, of course, there is a lot of discussion with the psychologist, with their doctor, but not everything is in the public domain. And, and this is always uh, the tricky thing as a scientist. Of course, we want to get all that information because it's so important. But astronauts don't always want to share it because, one, it's confidential, it's personal. Two, they are sometimes afraid that it might impact that they can fly again, which for them, of course, would be a, a drama. So it, it's, I cannot give you a concrete example of where we really had a team crisis. Um, but of course, I mean, I, I mentioned the buoying, uh, you know, the astronauts that go from eight days to eight months. This has a, a big impact on you know, the individual psychological state, but also on the team, because the team was preparing for something completely else, because in the end, the crew is very different from what they have been training for. You know, so, so surely every astronaut deals with that differently, but we don't always know exactly. We, as scientists, don't always know, okay, wh what, is that, what does that really mean? Um, there are other examples uh, with the geopolitical situation with, with Russia. We are still having a mixed crew on the ISS. This, of course, also must give rise to some difficulties uh, for, for the crew there. But, you know, day to day, I would say it works fairly well, but we don't always know what goes on behind the facade, which I think is also logical because everybody is also entitled to, to their privacy. But maybe just to reassure you in that regard, we've been doing now for more than 20 years missions on the ISS. I'm sure there have been criticalities, but never to the point that we had to abort or you know, stop or, yeah. So it also shows that it is manageable with the note that of course on the ISS, there is a lot of communication with Earth. This will also be more tricky for a mission to Mars, um, yeah. Un'ultimissima domanda, se volete, ultimi minuti, ultimi tre minuti. Se non c'è nessuno, faccio allora un ultimo. Ah, prego. Uh. Okay. Eh, salve, buondì. No, volevo chiedere questo. Se, visto che è stata presa in considerazione eh, la mettersi, come si chiama? Ibernazione. Ibernazione, esatto. Eh, se si è anche considerato i tempi massimi in cui si potrebbe fare questa ibernazione andando ad esempio su Marte, cioè due mesi, tre mesi o, o tempi più lunghi? It's a very good question. Right now we are very far from implementing hibernation on people. Uh, so we have not looked into what could be feasible in terms of the duration of the hibernation. What we have started to look into is the ideal conditions for humans to, w to enter in a state of hibernation. It, it has to do with the lightning, it has to do with the temperature, it has to do with the food an astronaut needs to take before because we need to beef them up. This is also what bears do. They, they eat a lot of salmon, which is very fatty, uh, before they go into hibernation. So we have started to look at those elements, but not at all from, you know, how long would it be possible because right now we are very far from doing it, both from a, you know, from a human perspective, but also to have the technology to support it. Because, of course, if you hibernate the astronauts, you need to still have some sort of medical supervision or support. You need to monitor them. Uh, what we have looked at is what that would look like. For example, like a, a pot where you would put the astronauts in and what level of support you would need. And also when we consider a mission to Mars, we would never have the whole crew hibernate at the same time. Those are the elements that we have looked into. But I think you ask a very valid question, but it's, it's, we are not there yet. So the research we are doing is really early stage 
so maybe in 10 years time we can we can give you a better answer to your question today we are far from from that uh, yeah Bene, sono le 12.30, quindi io direi che la nostra conferenza può chiudersi qui oggi. Ringrazio ovviamente Angelique van Ombergen dell'Agenzia Spaziale Europea per essere stata qui con noi oggi e per averci raccontato tutti i rischi che si possono correre andando nello spazio. Ancora grazie mille Angelique. Grazie.